So thank you very much, uh, Scott, for that introduction. Uh, and uh, I'm going to tell you about our project called Spit for Science. And uh, the first page shows some of my main collaborators on this project. Uh, and of course, a, a large scale project like the one I'm going to tell you about couldn't be done without uh, major funding. You can see here that I have a few conflicts, none of which pertain to anything I'm going to talk about. But I am going to talk about the measures that are listed here under intellectual property. And the IP for those are owned by my hospital. Go figure. Um, but they are available to scientists just if you contact me. At the end of the uh, presentation, if you find some of these measures interesting, contact me and I can help you implement them. So my, I work with a group of people who are obsessed with trying to understand the nature of neurodevelopmental disorders better. Because neurodevelopmental disorders are very prevalent, they last a lifetime, and they're extremely impairing. In particular, two disorders which I'm going to talk about today, ADHD and obsessive compulsive disorder. ADHD is probably the most common child mental health problem in about 5 or 6 percent of the population, and OCD maybe 1 or 2 percent of the population. And these disorders start early in life, and, and they tend to persist. So um, what you have is disorders that cause a tremendous amount of impairment over the entire lifetime. Now we know that there are genetic and environmental influences on these disorders. Those disorders are associated with a variety of higher level cognitive deficits. I'm not talking about IQ per se, I'm talking about uh, issues that have processes that have to do with thinking, learning, and action. And they are also associated, there are many psychiatric comorbidities, so children present with one, more than one disorder at a time, and these conditions often co-occur with other medical problems. And although for years we've been treating both of these disorders quite aggressively, they really are incompletely tr treated. So for that reason, people have been very enthusiastic about trying to discover the genetics of these psychiatric disorders. And finally, I think we have some major progress. Um, in press now, there is the first, going to be the first uh, genome-wide significant findings uh, in ADHD. Uh, this will be in Nature uh, Genetics. It's just forthcoming. Uh, we all participated in this study and we managed to collect 20,000 cases and 35,000 controls and there are 12 loci implicated. Up till now there have been no findings uh, in OCD but you can see that the number of cases that the community of OCD investigators have been able to collect has been much smaller. Um, so that's where the idea for spit for science comes in. The idea is to try and develop a, a parallel or complementary research strategy that will allow us to accelerate discovery in the nature of conditions like ADHD and OCD. And it, the rationale for these, for Spit for Science, is based on three things that I'm going to describe to you. One is using quantitative trait approach rather than categorical diagnostic approach, uh, including cognitive endophenotypes in the study and focusing on a community sample. And I'm going to give you just a sampling of the findings, an overview. I'm going to focus more on the results with respect to OCD than ADHD or cognition. But the idea is to illustrate the uh, advantages of this approach and, and then we can discuss possibly some of the disadvantages. And I'll allude to the fact that we have um, are planning for the future because we are just about to start Spit for Science 2, uh, which will involve a lot of kits, spit kits from DNA Genotech. Okay, first, uh, the rationale for quantitative traits. Uh, diagnostic categories in mental health are based on a number of premises that are helpful and partially, but not completely true. So, for example, it conceptualizes psychiatric disorders as separate and distinct. Uh, usually a diagnosis is based on a count of the number of symptoms that are predefined in a diagnostic manual. If you pass an arbitrary threshold of the number of symptoms, you get a diagnosis. If you don't, you don't get a diagnosis. And even though disorders are widely understood to be multidimensional, so 
take for example ADHD, you can be inattentive, you can be restless, you can be impulsive. Regardless, you get one diagnosis at the end, ADHD or not ADHD. Severity is not critical. So if you're over the diagnostic threshold for ADHD, you may be very far over, you may be very severely affected or not so severely affected. And if you don't meet criteria for the disorder, your sub-threshold, there's lots of evidence that you might still be impaired, but you don't get a diagnosis. You, don't, you get, don't get included in a diagnostic group, and worse, possibly, you might in, get included in a control sample. Um, and when you're working with diagnostic assessments in a clinical context, which is where they're typically, these samples are typically collected, the progress is actually slow and expensive. So by contrast, if you conceptualize psychopathology as the extreme of widely distributed traits in the general population, traits that are widely distributed in the general population, as I'm showing here, um, you, you, can, um, you can actually avoid some of the problems of the diagnostic categories. But you have to have measures that are sensitive to the full distribution of a trait, I'll return to this, that has to cover from strengths to weaknesses. And you also have to entertain the possibility that the low end of a trait is actually another disorder and not just the absence of a trait. So for example, somebody who's absolutely not restless, inattentive, or impulsive and can stay perfectly calm and attentive in the most noisy environment, maybe they have a different kind of disorder. Cognitive endophenotypes are a necessity because psych psychiatric disorders are based on latent traits. You can't really measure inattentiveness the, or uh, distractibility the way you can measure height. So the idea is to, uh, of endophenotypes is to come up with uh, measures that will be able to reliably measure the, these, these traits, that the trait measure should be associated with the disorder. For it to be genetically informative, it should be heritable and share genetic risk with the disorder itself, should respond to treatment possibly and be state independent. So if a person's phenotype is waxing and waning for a variety of reasons, this endophenotype should remain stable. It should be feasible for large scale studies and have biological plausibility. In our lab, we've worked with cognitive measures, but you can see from this schema that you could have biomarkers or endophenotypes at any level of analysis between genomes and phenomes. And in particular, we've worked with a measure called the stop signal task, which takes 12 minutes. It's a measure where you actually get people to do a, a task, a very simple choice reaction time task. They have to respond to X's and O's on a screen. People can do this really quickly and accurately. And on a subset of trials and at random, you give them an auditory tone and you tell them, when you hear that tone, try to stop your response. And by applying a, the race model, which I could answer questions to about after the talk, you can estimate the latency of the, the, the stopping response, which is otherwise not measurable because if you stop, there's no button press to use as an estimate. Now the stop signal, uh, the, the measure of response inhibition is called stop signal reaction time or SSRT. You can also measure reaction time variability and you can also measure uh, the way people adjust when they make errors, which I will return to. Now we know a ton about this phenomena called response inhibition. We know it's a replicable deficit in ADHD, several hundred studies. It's stable and uh, persistent trait. It runs in families, it's heritable, it responds to stimulant medication, it's impaired by, by trauma um, and conditions that cause demyelination, it's um, uh, impaired in particular by medial frontal lesions, and fMRI studies show that it activates inferior frontal gyrus and basal ganglia. So with these kinds of tools in hand, we undertook the Spit for Science project. We partnered with, a, with the Ontario Science Centre, which is um, a, uh, um, a big institution in Toronto that puts on public displays of uh, science uh, 
of all different kinds. And one of their mandates is to support people doing research, but they had never done a project this size. They have very strict requirements. You can't interfere with a person's trip to the Science Centre, so you're allowed 30 minutes with a volunteer. So we set this project up so that we could uh, collect the data that we needed, or as much data as we could in 30 minutes. We saw over the course of two summers nearly 17,000 children between the ages of 6 and 17 in this 30-minute protocol. The parent would um, uh, provide medical information, medical history, treatment history, and fill in some trait questionnaires, which I will describe, while the child went to another station and did the stop signal task. And then afterwards, as you can see here, they would sit in a corner and spit to provide the DNA sample. And we used barcodes to keep everything organized. Um, we used a uh, uh, genome-wide microarray in the Caucasian subsample, which I will uh, point out in a second. And we also were able to identify 220 twin pairs in this uh, sample. Uh, these are the distributions of the trait measures that we use. So we used the SWAN questionnaire, which uh, measures ADHD traits from weaknesses to strengths. And we use the stop signal task, so you can see that on the right the distribution of SSRTs. And in the middle is the questionnaire that we developed specifically for this task, which we call the TALKS. It's kind of a, a swan version of an OCD questionnaire, so it goes from strength to weaknesses. It doesn't have as neat a distribution. These are the raw scores. When you transform that, it's very neatly normal. The sample looked like this. They were about 11 years old, half boys, half girls. More than 80% of the informants were parents. In older kids, sometimes they informed on themselves. Uh, the was sample, as you can imagine, because people come there on family outings, was enriched for families. And um, this ethnic breakdown is typical of Toronto, which is to say that uh, just about half of Torontonians are Caucasian, uh, and the other half either mixed or non-Caucasian, as you can see which is both an advantage and a disadvantage. Um, Self-reported diagnoses are as shown here, and you can see that 6% of people said they had a community diagnosis for being treated for ADHD. And you can see also that about 1% said that they had a community diagnosis or were being treated for OCD. These, these prevalences rates are pretty typical of what you would find in population studies. The Toronto Obsessive Compulsive Scale needed development because we hadn't, uh, it ha we developed it for this study, so we looked at its convergent validity, its um, discriminant validity, it discriminates people with and without a diagnosis of OCD, for example, and we looked at its dimensionality, as, and you can see that it's a dimensional scale, um, as has been found in uh, other OCD questionnaires. These traits are heritable. Uh, OCD uh, talk scores were, were highly heritable. SWAN scores a little less so. Response inhibition, 47% heritable. And co-heritability between response inhibition and ADHD was also significant, but low. We prepared the samples and genotyped as you would expect. I won't harp on that. You, and this is the kind of flow of the samples. We started with um, uh, 16,718 with complete demographic and trait data. We genotyped them, almost all of them, on the Illumina Human Core Exome Array. And we then uh, did the GWAS on Caucasians, one sibling per family, uh, and people who passed the QC. And this is one of the first um, uh, interesting findings. We've, we have when we did a GWAS on the talk score, we identified for the first time a genome-wide uh, lo uh, significant locus, locus for OCD traits, which is in PTPRD. And this is uh, a close-up of that region. Now, um, then we were able to replicate that in two other much smaller samples from OC Gas, which is the large OC consortium, and the CHOP sample, which you probably have heard of. Um, and uh, this is what we know about PTPRD. It's expressed on presynaptic cells. 
and interacts with different proteins on postsynaptic cells to facilitate neuronal differentiation. And in particular, on GABA neurons, it's involved with this SLITRIC3, which has been implicated in OCD uh, previously. And these, this finding um, complements the top hits in OCGC gas, and it also converged with a rare copy number variant that we found in a clinic sample of OCD kids. So then we, for fun, asked the question, well, did we really need this bivariate distribution of OC traits? What would have happened if we collapsed all the low scores onto zero, which is essentially what a typical uh, symptom scale does. So most people in the community have no symptoms. You don't ask about whether they have a strength. You just code them as having no symptoms. So you get these really rather catastrophic J-shaped distributions. So we collapsed our talk scores that way. We made all the scores below zero into zero, and we redid the GWAS, and you lose your significant findings, suggesting that the bivariate distribution uh, or bidimensional distribution is important. We conducted a hypothesis-driven GWAS, which uh, basically tests the association uh, of particular gene sets, uh, for example, brain development gene sets, um, to the trait. And we found, uh, when we tested a number of gene sets, uh, we did not find an association with glutamate, but we did with brain development genes. And in particular, genes that are expressed in the uh, corticostriatal thalamic circuit were highly associated with OC traits. Uh, we looked at polygenic risk scores. We asked, would polygenic risk scores from clinic samples of OCD map to TOX scores? Uh, what about uh, polygenic risk scores from other disorders, let's say ADHD and anxiety? The only polygenic risk scores that map to TOX were uh, those derived from OC sa uh, samples of people with obsessive compulsive disorder. We called copy number variants and uh, Mehdi Zare is going to be presenting this on Friday. That's the poster and he's in the audience. If you want to ask him any questions, I won't give you the details of that. But we found a, a relationship between global burden and ADHD traits and response inhibition. For ADHD traits, it was a, uh, a burden of uh, losses, and for response inhibition, it was gains. In addition, OC traits were enriched for uh, synaptic neurotransmission genes, uh, as were the um, uh, deletions and um, uh, duplications in uh, the other traits. So just to summarize, so we have time for questions, it, 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 OCD traits can be measured in the, a community sample using a measure like the TOX. And you end up with a widely distributed, uh, wide distribution of these traits from strengths to weaknesses. And those traits are heritable. Using those traits, we've got the first replicated genome-wide significant hit in OCD. And that's PTPRD. If you truncate the distribution, you lose power. Um, brain development genes seem to be particularly implicated. OCD traits share some genetic risk with OCD diagnosis, and both common and rare variants are involved. So what's the general potential for this approach? Well, number one, rapid sample collection uh, from populations that are rather more representative of the general population than you might have predicted. You get high quality data at a relatively low cost, that $25 estimate, and that's, by the way, that'd be about $20 Canada, uh, US. Um, that, that is uh, uh, our estimate of what it costs to collect the phenotype, not everything else, as opposed to several thousand dollars to see a child through the clinic uh, and do the same sort of assessment. And it seems to shorten the path to discovery. I must say that there were other potential other advantages to the approach too. One was it had a tremendous and unexpected knowledge translation impact. There were thousands of people coming to this exhibit at the Science Center and interacting with young geneticists who were working in the, in the project collecting data. And the uh, Science Center 
considers this to be one of their flagship uh, programs because of that quality of that interaction. It also allowed us to create exquisitely sensitive uh, norms and to validate several measures. So I'm showing the, um, the for example, we were able to norm the SWAN scale on 17,000 children and adolescents, boys and girls, and you can actually access that questionnaire at no cost. You can give it to your patients to use. Um, they can go on that website, they can complete it, they can get a report and bring it to you in your office if, if you, you want. And the talks will be in that shape soon too. The stop task is also available um, and we have, uh, w with the Science Center data, been able to build a back end of uh, norms. And the DNA has gone into the Sick Kids Healthy, Healthy Children's Biobank where it's already been used uh, for control samples to help find genes for Rolandic epilepsy and also it's currently being used, uh, uh, the, the, the East Asian subsample is being used to uh, further research in conditions that are more specifically related to that uh, population, that ethnic group. So the, just looking ahead, we've been funded to expand the sample to collect 30,000 new samples. So we'll have approximately 50,000 samples when we finish. Um, we're going to add, because we learned so much from the first spit one, where we reckon we can add additional measures. We've got new strategies for looking at environmental exposures. We collected postal code data, but now we can do uh, better with more specific geospatial mapping so we can extract from large databases environmental exposures um, from uh, these, these geospatial coordinates. That will allow us to have power and measures, more power and better measures for gene by environment interactions. We can do, because we collected multiple cognitive measures extracted from the stop task, we can do multivariate GWAS analyses and we've already done that and we have a new finding when you look at response uh, uh, variability and ADHD. And we are expanding strategies for recontacting our patients and uh, um, working with our REB, IRB to uh, facilitate that and health record linkage through the province of Ontario's health records. So um, I'm happy to take questions. I hope I've convinced you that it's a useful strategy, but clearly there's some strengths and weaknesses. So did the Science Center have any concerns about um, have asking kids about psychopathology or parents about their children about psychopathology? And you specifically mentioned autism because, as a matter of fact, there were quite a few children who self at parents and the children self-reported autism. Uh, we didn't have an autism sensitive trait measure. I'm not sure one exists, but if you have a good idea, I, I would like to learn about it and hopefully we don't have to create a new one and validate it. Um, the answer is basically no. The, it was, all, all this data I failed to say was anonymized at source. So we had no way of reaching these families. They had no way of discovering anything about their genomics or anything that uh, came out of uh, of the analyses. And I think that that actually appealed both to the participants and to the, the sponsors. The people were, uh, you know, we, there were conversations this morning in one of the symposia about uh, data privacy and um, one of the speaker, speakers made the point that the, in theory people are very concerned about their pri about privacy, but in practice they're, they're not. And they was using the story about Ashley Madison as an example. But um, uh, so if, if we try to do some of the other things that I'm talking about for SPIT2, where we retain some capacity to recontact, we're going to give some of that up. And the consent will be much more complicated. It will slow us down. Um, I think there are some real advantages to doing it anonymously at source. And um, because of that, really, the Science Center was essentially not concerned. Are people watching what's going on? I mean, are you like an exhibit in the museum? We are. An exhibit just like this 
we're we're right in the uh, in the uh, in the muse in the science center around a uh, an exhibit on psychological phenomena. Or we were. I don't know where we'll be next. Summer. Other people are looking in. It generates a tremendous amount of buzz. It's it's like something at a at a at a fairground. You know, everybody wants to. What is happening here? Can I participate? But the parents are sitting in front of a computer with no one watching with a cardboard divider. And when the children sit and do the stop task, they're also separated with a cardboard divider wearing headphones because the environment's noisy like this as well. And somebody's supervising every person who's completing any piece of data collection. Uh, but then they sit in a common area when they spit. They quite like that. <laughs> you know, uh, kids just love spit for science. It just tremendously appealed to them. <laughs>